Well, um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming uh, to this UKLA London event. Uh, my name's Tim Clare. Um, I work for WSP, where I run the due diligence business. And more importantly for this evening, I'm currently the vice chair of, of recently appointed vice chair of UKLA. Um, the format of tonight, for those who haven't been before, is we'll have presentations um, for around an hour, maybe a bit longer, followed by questions. And then afterwards, we'll invite you all um, to stay for a drink and hopefully um, discuss and debate uh, what's been presented. Um, presenting my two speakers tonight is interesting because one is a former colleague and one is a client. So I would normally say this is Serge and this is Doug. Um, and actually having to read, uh, read their, um, their pen picks is actually quite entertaining for me because I'm not sure how much of it's true. But we'll go <laughs> off anyway. <laughs> um, Dr. Serge Eunice. Um, um, I happen to, I've seen his PhD certificate, so I know that bit's true anyway. <laughs> Dr. Serge Eunice heads up the cross-industry clean energy offering at um, Accenture Sustainability Services Practice, um, which he joined about seven or eight months ago uh, and previously worked at WSP um, for six, or six. six years, where he was heavily involved in many of the um, major renewables projects that um, we're involved with, including um, Mazda, um, the world's first zero carbon city being built in Abu Dhabi. Um, Serge will lead off today, and then following Serge will be Doug Bryden. Um, Doug is Head of Environmental Law at Travis Smith, which he joined about a year ago uh, from McFarland's. Uh, Doug will be bringing a more legal edge to the evening and talking about some of the practicalities, is that fair? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> so and then um, we'll go into questions after that. If I could ask you to hold questions to the end, and then we'll um, have a proper Q&A session. Um, but rather than try and explain any more, I'll pass over to Serge. Thank you. Now let's see if I can remember how to make that work for uh, someone who works in an IT company. That should be fun. Um, you're all probably wondering um, what does an IT company has to do with that space. Um, we actually do quite a lot of work within the renewable uh, and clean energy world that goes beyond just setting up um, IT systems. Uh, but we are about 60, 70 people in the UK working in that space, providing various consultancy advisory um, from financing deals to uh, working, uh, providing strategic advice to organizations that generally don't uh, work within the renewable or energy space. So one of the things that I tend to do is um, effectively work with organizations that have never heard about renewable energy and try to get them to understand their role into it and uh, what they can contribute. Now, a lot of you, I know a lot of faces around at the table today. Uh, a lot of you may have heard me before. I generally tend to go straight into the subject and give you a bit of nitty gritty on the technical aspects of renewables. I thought today um, w I would change a little bit and give you a bit of context uh, before we move on to Doug's presentation uh, by looking at the clean technology markets across Europe, um, where it's going, where it's heading, what are the challenges over the next decade uh, or nine years left in that decade. So about a year ago, um, a number of organizations came together, 29 in total, representing about 14 industries, and worked out how's the world going to be in the next four decades, and what are the challenges that are taking us out there. And what was interesting is that a lot of those organizations agreed that there's going to be about nine-ish billion of us around the world, and the fact that a lot of it is going to be growing in uh, the BRIC countries and other uh, transitional countries. Uh, and the fact that we're going to be mostly older population and we need to understand how we can change the way of today's consumerism within the framework of a limited resource world uh, going forward. So, you, you know, you've seen a number of names um, listed on the slides, uh, the eons of this world and Volkswagen and so on. Yes, there are some of the visionary companies that are working out there and looking at things, but interestingly, there are others that are trying to push in that space. Now, the, the ultimate goal of the Vision 2050 is that saying that there's a whole bunch of countries that are 
pretty much advanced from a human development index. And if you've never heard of the HDI, it's basically an amalgamation of GDP, uh, literacy rates, and a few other uh, kind of living standard uh, indices in there. But the one on the y-axis is interesting. It's called the ecological footprint. And I've used that before mm -hmm. to kind of give an indication of how much resources we consume. So countries that are consuming above the 1.8 limit, which you can see it at the bottom, are generally countries that are uh, consuming more natural resources than the Earth can provide. And you'll see a lot of countries. I've been trying to work this laser, but it, the screen doesn't allow it. So I'll use the mouse pointer. You see a lot of countries in that bottom end here, which are African countries, who um, are very underdeveloped in terms of human development index, uh, mortality rates being high, etc., um, and their economy being low. But you know, as you can expect, they don't consume a lot of resources. While European countries, uh, North America, somewhere up there, um, do consume above their share. Now, ultimately, where we want to be in about four decades is most of the countries need to be in that magic box. And what we're seeing is the BRIC countries are generally the ones around here, and they're all going from that way all the way down there. We need to try to get most of those high growth countries, high growth in population economy, uh, down to here. The challenge is a bit interesting uh, in the fact that we've been trying to negotiate that at the UN for the last two decades uh, with limited success. And uh, organizations, businesses in the private sector are saying, OK, we're getting tired of inability of governments to do anything. And it's time that we need to move on. So what we're seeing is a new paradigm where the private sector is actually starting to do things. So we went around um, last year, and we did uh, with the UN uh, Global Compact a study of CEOs across the world. So we saw about 800 or so um, CEOs across all of the industries at the bottom. And we asked them some strong questions around what's their view on sustainability. Now, that study had been done in 2008 and in 2005. And what was interesting about the 2010 is we actually wanted to know whether recession had anything to do to change people's mindset in a negative way. And it's, it's funny. So if we look at the most important question that we asked them, which is, um, you know, how important is sustainability for their future? Um, on average, about 93% of them, it's important. Uh, with about 39% of all respondents, that's 800 of your top companies, private sector companies that are listed, saying it is very important uh, for them to work. And that's cut down across the sectors. So what is interesting is that it's not just the 29 organizations that were part of this study that came around and said, we're going to do the Vision 2050 and do something about getting us to that kind of magic box at the bottom of the graph. But 800 organizations are saying it is very important to our survival. Uh, the funny thing is the 2008 survey, so pre-recession, uh, only 61% said it was important. So, and none of them said it was very important. So there's been actually an interesting dramatic change in mindset, which encourages us. Now, coming back to the Vision 2050, we've looked at delivering a roadmap of where we are today and where we want to be in four decades. If we look specifically around energy and power, the building and mobility vectors at the bottom, you'll see towards the top right that we're saying that in 40 years' time, we're going to secure a low carbon uh, energy. We're going to have all buildings being zero net energy, and we're going to have reliable low carbon mobility. Big things to say in 40 years' time. But to get there, there is a path to take. And we've, if we see at the bottom, those are actions that we're looking at today, things around demand side management in energy, things around reducing the cost of renewables and increasing the penetration of renewable technologies within the real estate and built environment um, space. We've then done a very recent report, which I have a copy or two if you'd like to uh, get off me, um, around what does that mean in terms of how much money we need to spend. And we looked at 15 technologies. Uh, covering buildings, covering energy distribution, production, and transportation. And the number is quite dramatic, that within the next nine years, in the EU zone alone, we need 2.3 trillion euros to get us just to the 2020 targets that we're set. That is a lot of money. Now, going back to the vision 2050, what is interesting is to get us down that path of a low-carbon future in terms of energy and mobility, 
we're only spending an extra 1% of global GDP compared to the current 6% of GDP that we're spending on our business and as usual model. So it's not a major task, it's just the quantums are quite big and needs to be looked at in more details. So looking at the building sector in the top right of that kind of circular graph, we're seeing that we see the smart buildings um, and technologies that already exist in the commercial sector, we need to drive them more and uh, get them higher penetration, but that's only about 100 billion in the EU zone. Solar panels, we've brought it out of electricity generation into the built environment, so it's figured uh, quite highly in the building sector, and that's only about 150 billion, I say only, compared to what we're currently spending on offshore wind, which is 180 billion, or what we're expected to spend on other technologies um, in the energy generation sector, about 500 billion. Now, if we drill down a little bit in more details um, in terms of procurement capital, we're, we're, we've done on purpose not to present development capital. So this is the capital required to actually get those technologies from emergence all the way down to maturity and full-scale deployment. Uh, but that's a good portion of it. But the bulk of the money is on procurement. So that 508 billion that we're expecting in the UK, we're expecting to spend 44 billion of it. Again, this is a, a target to get to the 2020 overall carbon reduction targets by uh, the end of the decade. Looking globally at what's happening with renewables, it's quite interesting as well, is that a lot of the technologies that we thought are emerging are actually the high growth technologies. And even within 2009, 2008, a lot of those technologies have, have actually peaked in terms of spending. So people in mid-crisis have actually spent the highest that they've ever spent on solar technology, on wind technology. And the growth for 2011, 2012 is quite exceptional, where a lot of countries, although they've said they're reducing their subsidies, and we'll get to, to that at the end of my presentation, are actually um, seeing a lot of private sector spending in that. Now, drilling down a bit more details, one interesting thing that we've seen is pre-2008, a lot of investment in procurement capital actually came on balance sheets. We we're trying to understand why. So you'll see a lot of large developers in wind actually coughing up most of the money. We're seeing transactions on secondary market after construction. But initial indications that we're seeing now is within the last six to seven months, there's been more and more structured deals pre-construction, which is a good sign for the market that it's actually getting to maturity. People are understanding what's going on. And we're also seeing a lot of non-traditional players, so the non-utilities and non-energy developers getting into that space where organizations, the likes of Nike and other consumer goods organizations are saying, hey, we need to actually take a stance in that and take a stake in it. It is not core business, but it is very important for them going forward. Now, looking at the buildings side of my um, analysis here, we're seeing that you know, while we were looking at 44 billion being spent on large-scale energy generation, 77 billion will be required on building assets, and a lot of it actually coming, I think it's about 15 billion um, of that 77 going on small-scale renewables in the built environment. Now, European governments, uh, have Taking that graph, I know it doesn't represent all of the EU, but this will, those are the countries where we've seen the most growth in Europe in terms of renewable energy. What the left graph tells us is where are the subsidies going? We've seen a lot of countries in the last two years saying that we're actually changing the way we're providing subsidies, in a lot of cases reducing them. So we've seen Italy reducing their subsidies um, over the new year. We've seen Spain doing that last year for obvious reasons. And actually even Germany have changed um, their plans. What is interesting is that those three countries did it for different reasons, where the Germans actually have hit most of their targets for renewals or are way beyond what they were expecting for 2020. Other countries are struggling more in terms of how do they provide that subsidy. But the latest news, which is a bit sad, is post Fukushima, a lot of those countries are reviewing their overall national strategies in terms of how do they bring in subsidies, how do they move away from nuclear into more um, kind of non-nuclear clean energies. and. Italy and Germany have already, having already gone back about six months ago and said, we're not, we're reducing the subsidies for most of the technologies, are now going through and saying, actually, we're going to increase it because it's a survival issue for us, rather than we're just stimulating markets. While others like France and the UK are debating their national mix and what's the future around renewables. 
Another interesting thing is, in particular for the UK market, is we're seeing a whole <laughs> bunch of players getting into the space of clean uh, technologies and photovoltaics and so on. And that's a graph just for the domestic energy market. And I've done it on purpose to remove the names uh, for privacy of those organizations. I'm sure you can guess some of those names in there. Uh, but where you would generally see that the UK energy suppliers would be the big players, and they are the big players, uh, the white van man, uh, kind of cluster in the market is actually a major part of the market, and that raises a few issues around kind of cowboy installers uh, giving you wrong advice. But there's organizations like insurance, like uh, your typical B&Qs and Tesco's and so on. <laughs> Everybody is getting their share of the game, which is very good for us um, as consumers, where we're seeing uh, non-traditional players actually getting to the game, stimulating the market. But also it gives us another image is that the trend from us consumers is yes, we want it, and we want to procure it from across uh, all the industries, not just from whoever is giving us electricity and gas. And that pretty much concludes my presentation, uh, giving you a kind of brief overview of where the market is in Europe and where it's going in the UK. And I will hand over to Doug to give you a bit <coughs> more in-depth details on the UK market. Up to you. Hello everyone, just bear with me, I've got a few buttons to just quickly uh, push here, let's have a try. Right, here we go. Um, now, so just give me a very kind of aspirational look about what's going to be happening over the next 50 years or so. And um, there is a huge amount of noise still on this area, both in climate change and greenhouse gas reductions, but also in renewables. And I just don't think it's going to go away. However, the landscape is changing, and it's changing very rapidly at the moment. So I'm going to look at the legal perspective um, in a bit more detail. And in particular, I'm going to look at kind of micro-generation, so how it really attaches to what I would refer to as green real estate. You have your large offshore wind farms. I'm not going to touch on that. I'm looking about FITs how smaller scale renewable is suddenly coming into play and how it's suddenly, I would say, getting a little bit more mainstream. So it's actually branching out of more heavy energy and your traditional generators into a whole new realm of clients. I think that was actually very clearly illustrated by Serge's graph. And I think also I'll touch on the cowboy element as well. Um, so i look at the um, legal and political drivers in a little bit more detail. I'm assuming quite a lot of you will know that already. Um, incentives uh, for the environmental lawyers, and I really am talking to environmental lawyers today because I am one, and there are a lot of other legal aspects to this which I will highlight, but I won't go into detail. And I think that's a really, really important point to note for the lawyers out there, is that... Um, you know, you've got to really think where is the work for us as environmental lawyers. You know, there are a lot of people who can do all the different aspects, but we've got to be very, very focused on how can we get some work and how, if possible, can we start leading it forward. And that's very much for all our respective practices. I'm sure that's not news to anyone, but um, I'm trying to just elicit where we can find the work for, for our practices. Um, so we'll look at incentives, because that is definitely one of the areas where an environmental lawyer can add value at the moment. I won't look at all of them. I'm going to be looking predominantly at FITS, because it's all very exciting. There's lots happening at the moment. And I'll touch on the renewable um, heat uh, incentive, which is the next one, which is on, on the stocks and is about to come live um, shortly. So they're the two that I'll focus on. And then I'll look at those other legal considerations, which is your real estate planning, commercial, regulatory, and I have EU hurdles at the end. And we'll come to that shortly. And I'm hoping for input from other people, by the way, on some of these. But um, that last section, that's more trying to give you a steer on the other legal issues which you need to flag up to your clients. Uh, and when you're selling this, you need to sell it as a more holistic, broader team. And that's very, very important. So, legal perspective. Um, the UK government is very committed to developing more renewable energy and reducing its CO2 emissions of the UK. It's not only committed to it, in some instances it's legally bound to do this. Now, 
this has been around for quite some time. I mean, a lot of this has been in the headlines, I think, for the last three or four years. But it was back in 2000 under the Utilities Act where that was the first time where commitments were then placed onto the generators to source a certain amount of their electricity generation from renewable sources. And that gave birth to the renewables obligation or the ROCs, which is a beautifully British way of doing things. It's quite complicated and it was slightly out of step with the rest of Europe, which went for FITS, which was a much simpler system. So that's been around for some time and that's slowly developed and is still with us today and it will be um, for some time, although, as we'll come to in a minute, things are changing. But things all really started to heat up in 2008 in the UK with both the Climate Change Act and the Energy Act. Now, I wrote down loads of percentages and figures and targets and when we had to do things by sometimes, I was going to tell them to you all, but I then realised it's just going to go in one ear and out the other. I think the key thing you need to know is that the UK government has fairly onerous and um, fairly, um, well, they're going to be quite challenging targets to meet, firstly to reduce the UK's um, CO2 emissions. I mean, that's both at a UK level um, through the pieces of UK legislation, uh, particularly the Climate Change Act, but also at an EU level from the 2009 uh, Climate Change and Energy um, Package as well as the Renewable Energy Directive. Um, you'll quite often hear 2020, which is a 20% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2020. That's the EU one. In actual fact, the UK have gone a step further and we're, we've got um, commitments such as an 80% reduction by 2050 against the 1990 level, um, and that's for CO2 emissions. In relation to renewables, uh, the EU was a 15% overall percentage of um, uh, UK energy to be sourced from renewable, and again, the UK have gone a little bit further than that. I think it's currently about 30% by 2030. So. All you need to really know, and I'm sure you know all this already, is there's a lot of legislative drivers pushing this forward. The UK government have committed to do this. It now needs to affect these changes. And that is where we're seeing a lot of these incentives coming out and some of um, the other not so much carrots but sticks under planning law and elsewhere. And we'll touch on some of those. But um, that kind of set the scene up until about now-ish. And then the really important thing we all need to know is it's all about to change. And that there is a great uncertainty in the market in relation not only to specific incentives, but also in relation to the market more generally. Um, we have the new energy bill, which is still going through the legislative process. Um, that's going to give rise to what's referred to as the Green Deal. Um, I won't get into the specifics, but again, it's, it's going to be pushing this all forward. The idea is to incentivize renewables but the mechanisms and the way they're doing it is slightly changing. The other very important, probably actually much more important change, is the reform of the energy market more generally. Now, I'm not an energy lawyer, so I don't know energy, you know, the regulatory market inside out at all, but it is certainly all changing. And I'll just skip on to the next slide. I think it's, it's all here. This is slightly old. This is from December 2010, but this is where Hume's kind of summarising what's happening. And it's all there. This is what sums up. There are new incentives. Incentives are still going to be the driving force to make this change. Um, there is going to be a shift from fossil fuel to low carbon. Nothing's really changing there. And then it all gets quite exciting. It's a once-in-a-lifetime, a, a once-in-a-generation chance to rebuild our electricity market. And I think really what it's striving at is, and this is in the last line, it's talking about security of supply, affordability, and low carbon energy and it's through incentives. So that was in 2010 where there's this big play on an incentives and how the carrot is going to be used. And what's actually quite interesting since then, and again we'll touch on this in a bit more detail shortly, is that some of those incentives are all of a sudden starting to be pulled or changed or made not to be quite as um, inviting as they were originally. So I think incentives are still there, but it's, not, it's going to be a slightly different landscape, I think, over the next... Um, few months to few years, which I think for an environmental lawyer, given we can now comment on how this legislation is changing and how these incentives are changing, is in some ways quite good news. There's plenty for us to get our teeth into. 
But just going back um, a step, some of the other key kind of changes, and this is very much a conservative uh, policy which has come across into uh, the coalition, is actually moving away from the more traditional centralised energy generation to decentralised or distributed where you have a scattering of smaller generators which are nearer populations, are based on the community level. And so that means there's going to be a lot more little projects. There's lots more of little bits of work rather than your more traditional, very large oil and um, coal-fired power stations. So again, it's going to be spreading the amount of work out slightly. And then micro-generation therefore forms part of that. And again, when I think we're talking about green real estate, we really are talking about two things. It's micro-generation, and also we're talking about, which I'm not talking on today, is the other side of the coin, which is sustainability and energy efficiency. So they're promoting better use of uh, renewable technologies, and at the same time, through legislation such as CRC, EPCs, the building regs, they're also trying to tackle energy efficiency and making the actual use of the energy better in those buildings. So um, there's a whole kind of tapestry of legislation out there. So let's move on and start looking at some of these incentives in a bit more detail. Um, there's quite a lot of them out there. There really are. So there's a renewable obligations, uh, which are the, the, the long running, which have attached to the larger power generating plants. So that's where you have a large scale renewable project, such as an offshore wind farm. In addition to that, and more recently we have had FITS, and coming up shortly we're going to have uh, the Renewable Heat Incentive, and this is looking at the smaller scale, the micro-generation. Um, th but there are others, such as the Climate Change Levy Exemption, where renewable energy generators aren't going to be paying uh, their CCL, and also there are a range of kind of smaller, more community-level funds and grants which are sometimes available. What is you know what you need to know is that this this kind of coherent and um, incentive package is kind of central to promoting renewable energy, and it will be for the future. It's just what is that actually going to look like? And um, the other point I'd like to say is, which isn't on the slide, is that this is all very much buying into the carrot approach to getting these changes. Don't forget that through planning law there are also sticks as well. Um, I think. I'm not a planning lawyer, but the, the Merton rule um, is still in effect. I mean, I've done a couple of data centres recently where you're, very, you're getting quite onerous obligations under the 106 agreements, where you're not only having to do, let's say, a 10% of on-site or near-site renewable energy, that there will also be then some kind of offsetting mechanism where they'll calculate where you don't reach certain targets. You have to then start giving them money for the equivalent of an offset. Um, now, for some people, that just is, it doesn't hit the radar because the money doesn't, you know, it's just not material. But the numbers can be quite significant. So there are still sticks very much available to, um, to the regulators and to the planning authorities to try and force these changes through. And I think that brings me on to say is, you know, when we are looking at these, um, these issues from a legal perspective, you really do need to collaborate with your colleagues in different departments. I mean, a lot of this is going to be real estate, there'll be construction, there'll be planning, there'll be sometimes banking, there'll be tax. You really do need to have quite a diverse team to really advise across the board. It's just, I think, for the environmental lawyer, making sure where do we fit in and where can we make sure that we stay central to that. So, as I said, I'm going to look at the feed-in tariff in a bit more detail. And I think at the end, I think we're opening up a discussion and to get people's views on this would be... Um, really useful because this is quite a hot topic at the moment. This is specifically targeting, for those who don't know, your smaller scale generation, so that's sub 5 megawatts of certain types of renewable or low carbon energy, that's hydro, anaerobic digestion, solar PV and wind. And it came into force on 1 April 2010. Essentially, um, you get two elements of payment get a generation tariff, you get an export tariff. The generation tariff is the larger of the two and is probably the most important. 
And what is, what, is, what is very good about the feed-in tariffs, as opposed to the rocks or the renewable obligation, is you have much greater certainty. If you can get yourself locked into a tariff <coughs> as the current regime stands, it should be that you may have up to a 20 or 25 year, depending on your technology, guaranteed payment. Now, as we'll come on to, things are changing and all of a sudden these positions are slightly being eroded by the government. But it gives you greater certainty. You can actually project what your, um, what your generation from the um, incentive is going to be. But um, the generation tariff um, will very much depend on the technology being used. Um, they have banded the technologies to promote some over others. Um, I think large-scale wind, for example, gets, I think it's about five pence um, on the current tariff bands, whereas if you're doing large-scale solar, you currently get um, 30 pence, but that, that may well be subject to change. Um, so different technologies are being promoted, and also, importantly, the level of generation. If you're doing smaller, smaller scale, like sub-100 um, uh, watt, megawatts or... Um, sorry, 100 uh, kilowatts, uh, or, um, sub 50, you sometimes get even more. So there's a whole lot to look at. So it's all been working very well. Um, the legislation which brought it in was the Energy Act, 2008 gave the power. And then there's been two bits of legislation, um, which are quite a mouthful, which is the feed-in tariff, um, specified maximum capacity and functions order 2010. And there's the modifications to the standard license conditions of electricity supply licenses. And there is also a lot of off-gem guidance, which I'd recommend you look at if you are being asked to advise on this area. So, so far, so good. Why have I really wanted to flag up the feed-in tariff? Um, and this is where, I think this is where the danger is, where a lot of everything we hear about renewables and all these incentives. These incentives are the reason why people are investing in these kind of renewable technologies at a kind of a green real estate level. The technologies themselves quite often don't stand up to actually being commercially viable on their own. The incentives are absolutely critical in making this market. So if the incentives go, and you're advising on a transaction where it is, let's say, a solar park, and the incentive goes or is completely neutered, you might then be looking at a dead duck of a project where your client, if they're investing, could be getting themselves in for a 20-year commitment where they, the money or the projections are just completely gone. So you have to realize that these things are fluid. In Germany and the rest of continental Europe, where they suddenly hit their targets much earlier than suspected, they pull back the incentives and cut them back. The same thing is happening in this country. Now, it was always intended that the feed-in tariffs would be reviewed. As with anything, they needed to see how it bedded in to work out how certain technologies were being used. For example, anaerobic digestion wasn't being hugely implemented, so they're going to actually bolster those. The important thing is, solar was. Solar, everyone steamed into solar, particularly your larger scale solar. So that's from, that's up to the kind of the five megawatt band. And there were what people are referring to as solar parks. And I think the government have taken a fairly aggressive step instead of waiting for the review in 2012, announced in March this year that they're doing an accelerated or fast track review um, of the feed in tariffs. And that was predominantly focusing on the solar or larger scale solar PV plants. And what they were trying to do is prohibit or stop the large scale, kind of more industrial sized um, solar parks being built predominantly down in the southwest, um, and their argument being is that this was taking up a disproportionate amount of the tariff, and it was actually your kind of your um, <coughs> solar roofs and also your kind of domestic um, a domestic PV wasn't actually getting implemented as much. So this is absolutely massive step because a lot of people have invested a lot of time, a lot of money, getting the relevant planning getting the relevant grid connection agreements, although the grids may not be actually, you know, the connections may be made, but a lot of steps were taken um, to do it. But all of a sudden, the government's announced that they're going to be releasing legislation, apparently, in July this year, this summer, um, where the tariff for these certain projects will be taken from approximately 30 pence per kilowatt hour down to 8 pence 
right there, roughly. So it's a roughly about a 7% drop. And um, as you can imagine, this is throwing the whole industry into a bit of disarray. For the environmental lawyer, there is a lot for us to look at in this. There's a lot of steps you need to get through because one of the key aspects of um, this change is that they're setting a date, apparently. You know, it's all still in consultation and, um, um, and also there's a judicial review of this at the moment, but uh, of a date of 1 August where if you don't get your installation up and running and you affect what is known as the um, effective date or the eligibility date by that time, that you will not be locking yourself into the current preferential tariff and that you will be likely to be getting the much reduced tariff. Now, in the kind of four or five projects we've been advising on, that blows them out of the water. So they've either stepped away or they're just holding or the soft peddling just to see how this legislative change is going to come. When you actually have to then advise on it, it becomes quite tricky because there are two camps. There are the kind of people we've been advising, which are your investors, who are very risk averse and just want certainty, and there are your people who are in the hole who have bought the land, done a bit of work, pumped in a couple of thousand pounds or hundred thousand pounds, getting your um, planning permissions in place, who are desperately trying to say, no, 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 don't worry, this is not going to be a problem, we're all fine, you're going to get your, uh, you're going to get your tariff at your elevated rate. And so there is a bit of a clashing now. So there's a lot of good work for the lawyers, there's a lot of legal opinions flying around, and there's you know, a lot for us to look at. So watch that space. I mean, anyone who knows more about it, I'm sure some people have been advising in depth on this. Uh, any, you know, anyone's thoughts at the end would be uh, greatly received. But as I said, it is being judicially reviewed at the moment. The effects of that, I just don't know. But, um, so we'll have to watch this space. But that has blown a huge hole in it. Um, now, I'm just quickly running out of time. So feed-in tariffs, um, a huge step forward but the rug has slightly been pulled slightly and um, there was a bit of uncertainty there. And where there's uncertainty, there was a role for the lawyers to step in. And the next one is the renewable heat incentive, which is um, in a way very similar to the feed-in tariff, but instead of looking at electricity, they're now looking at heat generation. Uh, in March this year, the government has published its proposals for this new scheme. Um, essentially, there's two phases to this. Uh, it is, uh, there's the kind of, again, it's going to be a long-term 20-year tariff. And for the commercial, so the industrial business and public sectors, that's expected to come in this year. Whereas for phase two, which is the domestic, that will be coming in in 2012. And essentially, this will be looking at things like biomass boilers, solar thermal installations, ground source heat pumps, water source heat pumps, and on-site biogas um, combustion. So it's looking at the heat. So it's very similar, and in a lot of ways will mirror the FITS regime. But that's something to certainly keep your eye on, and there'll be more on this, I think, um, coming up in the next couple of months as people really start focusing on it. But we'll no doubt be asked to revise more on that. And then I think I'm going to park it there for the kind of the real environmental points, and I think it would be remiss not to flag up the kind of other legal aspects of this whole kind of space when you're advising on kind of micro-generation and green real estate. The first, obviously, is the real estate. And um, there's some really fundamental points which your colleagues or you will need to flush out with clients. And this is things like title issues, rights and consents. Whenever you talk to all these developers, they always use this phrase, is it fully permitted? And they're very much driving about the kind of public permits. So very much your, um, is there planning permission? Are there any permits required from the environmental perspective? There really aren't with these smaller scale, or very rarely. But what you've also got to remember is there's also going to be other rights and consents. You might need way leaves. You might need to get um, permissions to actually run cables through other people's mm. lands. That shouldn't be forgotten. Insurance and fire risk assessments are also quite important. If you're all of a sudden sticking a great big solar installation onto a roof of a warehouse, how does that affect insurance? Did insurers need to be notified? Do they need to be a part of the process? Will your premiums go up? Will new fire risk assessments need to be undertaken because you have new equipment, electrical equipment on site? These are all considerations which will need to be flushed out. 
And then we get to the leasing. Um, there's a lot of um, people out there at the moment proposing to lease roof space. So the um, solar panel manufacturers or the solar panel importers, developers, will come along and say, we'll take a, you know, a lease, very much like your um, radio masts or mobile phone masts, take a lease of your roof space, we'll install these, um, this installation at no cost to you, and you'll get the electricity free of charge or at a very reduced rate, and the kind of the rub for them is they'll get the feed-in tariff. Now, this has obviously been put on ice again by these changes to the, to the, um, to the incentive, but there's a whole load of issues coming out of it. If you see the standard leases which are offered up, you know, they're you know, totally in favour of the developer. And so you need to be very careful. I must flag, PLC have done a lot of work on this, and there's some actually very good um, leases, um, precedent leases on there. And I really, if you are having a provise on this, that's a very good port of call. But the kind of issues are, if you have an agreement for lease, what kind of um, conditions precedent do you need in there? Is it all dependent on getting locked in at the right tariff rate? If so, what kind of walkaway rights are there? Um, also, other things, security of tenure. I think that's all to do with the 54 Act. Um, but, uh, yeah, you don't want to get a business tenancy, um, which gives them um, an, ex an ongoing right um, to keep renewing the leases. Uh, the term, do you link it into the feed-in tariff? Um, how long do you actually want this project to go for? And there are other considerations, break options, operational issues, um, and uh, the construction covenants. So that's very much when we're looking at uh, you know, advising clients when these people come along offering to stick things on roofs. But as I said, do, do look at PLC. There's a lot of good stuff on that. And um, the next consideration is planning. As I mentioned earlier, there is a lot in planning on renewables you might find that you actually have some quite onerous planning conditions in relation to using renewable tech, um, technology and renewable sources of energy. Um, but also, when we're looking at, say, let's say, the solar roofs, consider if it's commercial, is a planning consent needed? Yes, it will be. If you're doing solar farms, yes, you will need some form of planning consent. What kind of 106 has come with that? You've got to keep an eye on that. There will normally always be some kind of rub where you have to go and hand a few um, of these installations onto a local, uh, you know, local authority building, and certainly what we've been seeing. And then interestingly, when you look at residential and this micro-generation, um, and I think the key thing is, uh, could you say it is a permitted development, i.e. you don't need to get any planning consent. In some instances it might well be, I think there's moves for small-scale wind as well as solar to sometimes get this permitted development status. So if anyone's got any update on that, that would be very interesting. Um, otherwise, if you can't get permitted development, it will then be your need for planning consent, and also just keep an eye out for listed buildings. And further considerations. Commercial. So this is really kind of illustrating my point about how it, these kind of projects go out into all different elements of your firm. Um, power purchase agreements, uh, th this will be key depending on what, how you're going to be using uh, your generated electricity. Will it just be on-site use or will you go to grid? How are you going to be um, um, documenting that? Insurance is another interesting one. Um, now, you speak to any insurance person, they're always telling you about some new product they've dreamt up. I think some of these do have value. This is very much along the lines of you've just spent a lot of money for some expensive bits of kit, it gets delivered, falls off the lorry and breaks. I mean, whose insurance covers it? When does your insurance um, cover those kind of damages? Uh, and there are bespoke policies being put in place um, covering that against that kind of risk. And I also believe that there are policies being put in place where um, some claimed generation amounts don't live up to, um, to, to what's been, uh, what it says on the box. So you buy your installation thinking you're going to be getting X, you don't get anywhere near it. And apparently there are insurance policies which will give you cover for that. So, um, I'm, yeah, there's plenty you can read on that on the internet. And um, I'm sure if you speak to some of the main brokers, they'll give you uh, information. Other point, and this goes back to this white van man or um, the kind of cowboy element. Actually, what kind of contractual rights of recourse do you have when you start doing these kind of solar roofs or small-scale developments. I mean, who are you getting into bed with, really? 
Now, there's some very large, reputable solar manufacturers. There's Bosch, there's First Solar, really big organizations, which are, you know, um, very pucker. I think you can say that they've got good, strong covenant strength. However, there are a whole load of others out there who might be buying these bits of kit. And you've just got to think, well, actually, what kind of covenant strength do I have? If things go wrong, is this actually going to last me the 25 or however long the feed-in tariff is going to run for? So that's just a consideration. And then lastly is national grid access and network distribution operators. You know, what kind of agreements are you getting in place if you are going to start selling your... Um, <coughs> selling your, or getting your um, generated electricity onto the grid. Uh, having had a look at getting grid access, first of all, it can take a considerable amount of time. Um, that can have huge ramifications about locking in your FITS tariff if the changes, which are going to happen apparently in 1 August, take place. Are you going to be able to secure your tariff? You might be able to get the thing up and built. You might, have, you might be able to argue that it's been commissioned. But quite unfortunately, um, Ofgem have said in some instances for it to be commissioned and therefore to be able to have an eligibility date and therefore to lock in your tariff, you may well need to have um, a national grid um, access. But that is a grey area and the heat, you know, is, is under huge debate because these installations don't take long to put up. They don't take that long to build. They don't take that long to do a lot of the infrastructure work other than the grid connection. The grid connection is the one thing which people don't really have much control of. And that's the one thing which is, I think, causing the greatest, certainly, on, certainly for in, in the cases we worked on, uncertainty. Because you cannot guarantee you get that grid connection. The only other thing is, it can be fiendishly expensive. It can range from a couple hundred thousand pounds through right to a million, and one of the ones we advised on, where there was a considerable length of cable, and it had to go through a number of different properties, and there was other. So. Um, don't don't um, really. I think grid. If you're talking about this to clients, is that's one of the first things you should be asking about. Are you exporting to the grid? Where are you on that? What's your timeline? How much is it going to cost? Other ones would be regulatory. Um, you know, do you need an off-gem generators license? I think the answer is going to be no, in nearly all cases. But um, off-gem will be the regulator for a lot of this. So you do need to um, interact with them, particularly when you're doing your FITS um, accreditation. Um, you also have to consider health and safety, um, risk assessments, people falling off roofs. Um, again, it's just one of those regulatory issues which you shouldn't just forget about. And permitting and compliance. Um, are there any permitting? Do you need any specific licenses um, under the environmental regs or elsewhere? I don't think so. They really aren't. Any, it's only I've advised on, but you never know. Depending what other kind of um, facilities are on site, you might have to consider that. But I don't think that would be a big um, top line issue. And uh, lastly, EU hurdles, state aid, and the City Works case. Now, um, I think the point I'm just trying to say here is that it's actually quite interesting when you have things like FITS and all these incentives. How does that actually sit with EU state aid legislation? I think that can be a consideration, particularly if you have projects which have um, got other public grants. And I think there are some, I, so I, I really, I haven't advised on this, I just know it is an issue and I kind of consider it, but if anyone can add more, that would be appreciated. But um, it, it's, I, think the, I think the risk is that, um, that you may be in breach of or have a challenge under this um, EU legislation where you're not only getting fit, but you're also getting grants as well. And you just need to be careful of that. And the Leipzig Airport case is a very interesting one. And this is where there was an off-site, so it was an off-grid. So, um, so its own little distribution network. And what the previous supplier of electricity said was, hang on a sec, this isn't competitive. I'm not able to supply um, or be able to even offer to supply electricity to these 80 or so um, users which are on this off-grid network. And I think the, um, the ECJ felt that that was indeed the case. And I think the government or Ofgem's guidance on this is if a third-party supplier comes along to one of these off-grid little communities and says, I want to also have access to that grid, i.e. hook onto it, and be able to supply electricity to it, it will have to be granted access. Um, 
that is my understanding of it. I think it's just one of those issues where it's worth bearing the, the back of your mind that there is also this kind of um, competition law which is to do with the um, internal electricity markets directive. And um, if you have got that, I recommend looking it up and don't listen too much to what I've said. But, uh, um, but it is definitely out there. And that's all I'm going to say. I think we're coming up to um, 7 o'clock, so I think we're spot on. Spot on. Um, I'm sure there's things people want to talk about, but I hope that's been helpful. And at, at that note, I'll um, open the floor to um, questions, comments. Um, as Doug said, I mean, the aim of the meetings is very much to, um, to stoke debate or um, and allow the people to uh, inject their knowledge as well. So if there's anything people want to add, we're just as keen to hear that as questions. So um, I'll open the floor. And I have a, a microphone to run over with. I forgot about that bit. You need to turn it on. From the bottom, there's a <laughs> rent thing here. Yeah. Use the tenant. Do it. <laughs> sure. Is it on? Yeah, that's on. <laughs> Herbert Smith are very keen for this microphone to be used, I point out. Hi, Sandy Abrams from Navarro. Um, I was just going to clarify on the state aid point. The off gem guidance that was issued earlier this year, it defines state aid very broadly. Um, and it could, for example, uh, new housing project PFI financed, and they're giving basically the roof space for solar panels. That could be construed to be um, state aid, to be publicly funded or some kind of public grant. Um, and therefore, your project would be capped at the de minimis threshold, so your 200,000 euros over three years, which on a large new housing project could be quite problematic. So it's the, it's the off gem guidance was issued, I think it was January this year, so it, it gives quite a lot of details. It wasn't terribly helpful guidance, it was a bit... Sure. <laughs> but how does that interact with the FITs then? Is that... Well, that means that combined, combined it, exactly it caps your same. FIT um, revenue at 200,000, yeah. yeah, over a three-year period as well. I don't think that's and something which has been widely communicated. I mean, um, I, I must be totally honest, I only picked that up in preparation for this talk. Now, also, I haven't been doing any kind of housing estate kind of advisory work, but I've really, it's not widely publicised at all, that point. I know the utilities have been bringing it up with DEC yeah. because um, they're finding that they're having to do the, do the actual declarations with the generator saying, no, I've not um, breached the threshold. Yeah. Um, and they've raised it with DEC because it's so broadly drafted that, you know, <laughs> things that you wouldn't normally think should be caught are, are being caught and, and capping fits even further than the review is going to cap them. I'm not a lawyer, but I've seen a few cases where uh, developers have had to look at ownership issues to get through that hoop. Yes, there are ways around it of, of structuring your project so you're kind of splitting it up into different packages and so on. So there are ways around it. <laughs> Thanks very much. Any further questions? Thanks. I'm Charles Clifford from Manchester. I'm, I'm not an environmental lawyer, so I bow to your uh, superior knowledge on all that. I do remember someone who's probably in this room writing a few years ago that we are all environmental lawyers now, which is exciting for the environmental lawyers. Um, <laughs> but there's, there's one thing I think, Doug, you, you're, you're talking about you know, where we can get involved, where the opportunities for lawyers are. I think there is a massive um, area which is sort of highlighted by this flood of legislation, some of it fantastically badly written. I mean, the FITS uh, our, um, indexation provision doesn't actually work um, if you read the words as a lawyer, but often think it will. Um, the, the concept that actually FITS is some form of state subsidy, which is, a, is, is tendentious to argue that because it is actually a cross-subsidy from one uh, buyer to those who haven't bothered to install mm -hmm. Uh, renewable uh, uh, energy equipment. But there's a huge role for lawyers, both in, in, in nurturing clients through this minefield of oncoming and, uh, and often badly drawn legislation, engaging with government in these consultations which it's putting out daily, and actually helping them draft this legislation, which you know, they're not actually, in all cases, perfect at. Um, and I think there's another area which it depends whether you think this is really a business opportunity or um, 
something which we ought more to be generally doing something about, which is actually helping, in particular, I suspect, local authorities understand the complexities, complexities, say, in the planning system of the need to implement broader government and EU policy through planning decisions and not to deal merely with planning law. And I suspect there's going to be a lot of argument on planning decisions as to whether broader government policy, EU policy and requirements on local authorities have been met. So it's a very exciting area and I think we, you know, I'm not in the environmental law box, but those in the environmental law box, if you just look slightly over the edge of it, there's a massive amount to be done uh, in those areas. Well, I think I agree at the moment. I think undoubtedly there is a lot to do. I think the key is then to make sure that when this tidal wave comes through of the kind of advisory and your interpretation and kind of negotiating mm -hmm. with government, that you somehow make sure that you've got some other role, because as with we or roast or reach or any of these kind of legislative um, beasts, when they come in, there's a lot of work and we're all very busy, and then all of a sudden, it, poof, it goes. Yeah. So we've got to just, and I think that's what I, I think we've got to be careful about. I think there is undoubtedly with the incentives, with, as you said, the, this um, machine gun of legislation which is coming out, some of it being done at such a rapid rate that, um, it's inevitable that some bits don't work. You know, with CRC, that's a classic example. Um, but it's just making sure that we keep an eye on, as a brethren of lawyers, you know, that actually, um, what's next? Is it just the next bit of legislation which is coming out? It might well be. It might well be there's something new on the horizon. But um, it's just thinking, actually, there's more out there rather than just that advisory role. Yeah. Thanks. Caroline May from Norton Rose. Um, Doug, I was pleased to see you emitting the sounds that Lucy and I often feel in our firm about there is a role for us in here somewhere. Um, <laughs> and every, suddenly everyone is an environmental lawyer, apart from the environmental lawyers, which is an interesting uh, feature. But the Fitz point about the review, have you run that past deck? Because there seems an awful lot of uncertainty, as you highlighted in your talk, about how clients can be sure that they will secure the preferential rates. Have you run the grid connection point past them and had it endorsed, or is that just something that you no, have suggested I mean, by way of establishing the we've project? We've looked at it in quite a lot of detail. And I mean, if, uh, the trouble is, it depends who you speak to. Um, you, you do get a lot of different answers. I mean, we've gone around the houses on the point. Hmm. Um, we were doing this about two weeks ago, and I think our position on um, the grid connection was, and this was off gem, not deck. Right, okay. Off gem would be the one who are forcing this. So they have two people who allegedly... Um, <laughs> in, who, I've they got they sometimes get behind deck, though, and blame each other. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, no, we've there's, had there's, that experience as well. As far as I understand, there are two people who are looking at this commissioning point, and this whole grid connection comes down in our analysis to commissioning. When is it actually capable of operation? That is, it's, the wording is very precise. It's capable of operation under the FITS, and then it says under the, the row mechanism capable of commercial operation mm. and for um, unfortunately the, the, the renewable obligation or the wording gets drawn into the whole roof fit accreditation process and so often very much are using their um, renewable obligation experience by saying look it's crazy how can you get how can you do the necessary tests to demonstrate commercial opera operation if you don't actually have the grid connection there mm. So if it's designed solely to, um, to, to um, export to the grid, i.e. there's no on-site, um, you know, it's not an off-grid mm. kind of setup, they're very much of a very strong opinion, how can you fulfill that test? And then they then get very grey and then say, well, you know, it's for you to demonstrate and would always be persuaded, and they give you some waffle along those lines. But if you've got a German client or someone who just wants, I want certainty, <laughs> yeah. and you can't give it, you just yeah. cannot give it. You cannot say, God, I hope I haven't offended anyone, sorry. <laughs> but um, but um, uh, you can't give that certainty because if the, if the regulatory authority is saying, you know, we'll, we'll need persuading, to me that says that's going to take time. If you've got this, you know, very harsh cliff, which you're going to have to get there before. So, yeah, we, we've done that. We've done it. We've spoken to lots of different people about it. And... Um, and as I said, there's lots of legal opinions out there, but um, 
when you read the legal opinions, I agree with every word they say. They just don't answer the question which you desperately want answered. Yeah. So they've been very well drafted by probably some people here, so I should yeah. shut up. But, but no, but yeah, I, to answer your question, DEC weren't particularly helpful, and to be honest, it was above them. They did not understand the implications of the actual accreditation process and how the effective date and how the locking in mechanism worked, where Ofgem, who do understand that, were yeah. absolutely crystal clear. For them, if it's designed to export to the grid and you do not have a grid connection, they would have severe difficulty in, a, in accepting that that is um, commissioned mm. and therefore you've got one of the essential ingredients for locking in that date. And then at the end of the day, the government can do whatever they want under the legislation review. We just mm. don't, we don't know. It's just very difficult from the uh, investment perspective, I think. There is an argument to be had, though, because using the analogy of rocks and the cut-off date for accreditation or whatever off, off general telling us on rocks. Uh, an offshore wind farm or a biomass facility sitting on, in and of itself uh, it is not going to be doing anything. It needs the grid connection, whereas actually you can have the self-generation on site uh, of uh, a PV yeah, yeah. park uh, that maybe in, in an industrial park or rooftop solar generating to the actual uh, oh, I, consumers. Oh, I really agree. So there is an argument to be had. Oh, I, I, I totally yeah. agree. It's just when the developer turns around and he said, that, you know, you've done your due diligence and the whole project is designed to be grid connected. And they say, well, of course, you know, we can do our own kind of on-site use. And you say, well, who's going to use it? Yeah. Well, and the, the, the argument to have with, with Ofgem is that it's not a standard asset. It is a viable asset in and of itself without the grid connection, providing that there is a consumer. Yeah. And, and I agree, and then, and then they'll quickly try... And, there, there were plenty of very, very valid arguments mm. and other arguments of you would then just try and commission a small part of it yeah. for, let's say, to do the lights up... To, you know, the street lights up to it. You know, there's, uh, you know, there are some brilliant arguments out there and I, 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 you know, I've got a huge amount of sympathy for them. And the, the argument being that if you can then get, you know, kind of it commissioned in an effective date, you then have a 12-month window to... Um, uh, to, to increase the size, to, to, to develop it further, and as long as you fall within those parameters. And, and I, I totally think these are wonderful arguments. It just goes back to that, um, that certainty point. Can you say categorically that this will fly? Ofgem actually are a lot more amenable on that kind of um, point about making it larger, you know, your extension point. But, um, and, and I agree, I, I totally agree. Some of these arguments of where you could just use some small amount of on-site. Um, I think the difficulty is that the, the bigger, and this is very much their point, which they've said articulated to us, is the bigger the difference, i.e. if it's meant to be exporting 5 meg mm. and all of a sudden you can only use a fraction of that, they said, oh, come on. Yeah, they said, come on, what are you talking about? But if you're then, you know, so it's a, it's a huge grey area. And, I, and, and I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not adamant on any of it. And I, and I'm, Although off GMR, I think they're naturally going to be very, they're not going to put their neck on the line. But amazingly, we have written responses from them on it. So um, they, they have, whoever it was, did send out a few emails. Um, so we do have some written, but for what it's worth, you know, this could all change. But it's a grey area, and if you want certainty, um, and you're for an investor's point of view, it's very difficult to give that mm. absolute mm. certainty. If you're a developer, on the other hand, we're advising developers, well, it's, it's, it's great, because you can deploy all these weird and wonderful arguments which are, you know, just you know, you're really academic and trying to work out very clever novel ways of getting around it. Um, but I suppose it very much depends what camp you're in. And, uh, and obviously we'll have to wait and see if the legislation or the judicial review um, or any of the other kind of, you know, I read this morning that developers had had reassurances that the consultation was being taken very seriously and that all their concerns would be met. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. But, you know, I think there's clear political impetus behind it. And I think, Paul, as you were saying earlier, actually this, it goes down to the point of the technology is not really there. And actually it's quite a big incentive for potentially not the, the best use of um, that money. Any further questions? Well, if there's not, um, that just leaves it for me to uh, thank Serge and Doug for their time in the presentations this evening. Thank you all for coming along. Um, thank Herbert Smith for their hospitality, um, which I hope you can stay a little bit longer and enjoy as there will be drinks at the back of the room. So once again, thank you to you guys and thank you all for coming along. Thank you.